Hello, good evening and uh, welcome to another How To Academy. I am Robin Ince, I've done a few of these before. Uh, I'm normally on, on Radio 4 doing the Infinite Monkey Cage. And uh, today's conversation, it's, it's a, 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 a fascinating new book and I think uh, many people are going to be surprised by uh, the the new understanding that has been uh, found for, uh, by our guest, Herman Ponzer, who is an Associate Professor of Evolutionary Anthropology at Duke University and Associate Research Professor of Global Global Health at the Duke Global Health Institute and also recently started uh, an article in the New Scientist with I think my favourite opening sentence of the New Scientist certainly this decade possibly this uh, century uh, when he began it with uh, the universe of good reasons for putting a live guinea pig in an insulated metal pot is small. We will be talking about that guinea pig shortly and that experiment. We won't be getting too specific about the guinea pig. It could be a kind of reasonably generic guinea pig. Uh, he's also written a book which has, uh, in the UK, the, the title Burn, The Misunderstood Science of Metabolism. But in the US, it goes really for a burn. New research blows the lid off how we really burn calories, lose weight and stay healthy. Good evening, Herman. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy to be here. Now, I want to start off before we get onto the subject of the book, and I, I will, by the way, mention to everyone as well, we will be doing a Q&A, so about, about 40 minutes in. So at any point, if you send in questions, we'll be dealing with those about 10 past, quarter past. But I want to start off just by your background and where your fascination begins, because uh, as someone looking at evolutionary anthropology, which still feels to me like, like quite a kind of a, a, a young area, a, a, a young discipline, was it from an early age that you started to be drawn by the by the stories and by the ideas uh, and the discoveries? You know, uh, I, I can't say that, you know, some people have these wonderful origin stories, scientists who've been, you know, they, they wanted to study the stars since they could walk kind of thing. Um, I grew up in a really rural part of Pennsylvania, you know, riding motorcycles and, and um, getting, you know, getting lost in the woods and, and uh, doing all kinds of rural fun things, riding horses. And I didn't know what I wanted to do at all until I got to college. And I went to college at Penn State University in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, I had a class which just blew my mind, which was Intro to Human Evolution. It was the small seminar class, uh, two great sort of, you know, old wizened professors that, you know, what liked to, to, to sort of, you know, blow up young freshmen's minds uh, by making you think completely differently than you ever thought possible about yourself and about humans and about, you know, time. Uh, and I thought, wow, man, if I could ever do this for a living, um, what, what could be better than that? And so I've been hooked since then. I can almost pinpoint it. It was the fall of 1995, my freshman year, first seminar there. And I knew, um, I, you know, I had no idea what I wanted to do for my life for, for a living, but I knew if I could do that, if I could somehow just think about human evolution for a living, I was going to give it a try. Do you have certain stories when you are, you know, if someone says to you, so what is it that you do? Are there certain you think this is, as you said, those stories that blow your mind, those. And what I think is very beautiful about this as a discipline is once you start looking into it, every bit of behavior that you look at, you can't help but start to try and track back where it came from, making the connections. So do, yeah. you, do you have certain stories that you think, yeah, this, this is the one to lay on the table first to lure people in? Well, you know, I, I like to just start with how completely bizarre people are. And, you know, it's the, what's the expression? The last thing a, that a fish would ever think of is water, right? Mm. It's the same kind of thing. The last thing, we don't think that we're weird, you know? Uh, we're, of course, we're normal. We're beautiful. We're whatever. And uh, think of just about how bizarre you look to every other animal on the planet. You know, this sort of naked, sweaty skin, this big bulbous head perched on the top of this, you know, little neck and walking around on two legs and making all these ridiculous sounds and um, your dangly bits hanging all over the place. I mean, you, come on, this is completely ridiculous. Uh, and just to kind of begin to, to open up people's mind and, and to see yourself the way kind of the, the, you know, the, the anthropologist from Mars would, would look at you. Uh, I think that begins to, to open people's minds, uh, you know, just, just how crazy it is that, you know, for example, you're born into this world completely helpless. You're a loaf of bread for two years, you know? Uh, what, what other animal gets away with that? That's crazy. You know, that's, it's mindless. Uh, and yet that's our evolved strategy, that kind of thing. That is such a, I mean, I, I do think that is, as you said, that bit of being a helpless creature for such a long period to have this brain that is also so dangerous for the person who's giving birth to you, all of those things. And I, I love the Martian. I, I know, you know, Oliver Sacks and Richard Feynman, that bit of saying, just be an alien. 
just step back and then everything becomes peculiar yeah. and fascinating. Yeah. And also, I want to just again before we get onto to metabolism, which obviously will be the the, the the main topic, but also to get a definition of, of epigenetics, as that's the area you're working, because it's a, a word again that feels as if in the twenty first century suddenly you'd be picking up newspapers and it will be all over the place. And I think the, the definition for people is sometimes uncertain. Yeah. So um, epigenetics is this is the idea that you know you come into the world with your genetic code ready to rock, ready to go. Yeah. And the, the, but the genes that you have and the variants that you carry of each gene don't actually tell you anything about how your body's going, you know, or very little, I should say, about how your body's actually going to look and function. And so there's this, there's, it's actually this conversation that your body has with its environment and your environment can actually push your body around. It can actually turn certain genes off or certain genes on. Um, it can have even larger effects than that, which is it can uh, it can change, you know, the way that your body allocates its energy, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about later, right? If you know, different lifestyles can can lead to different ways, different organs being more active, different organs being less active in response to energy stress and activity. So epigenetics is this sort of catch-all term for the the broader phenomenon, which is that, you know, the, the genes that you're born into the world with don't actually dictate everything about you, you know. Um, identical twins will have different physiologies, right? Because of the way that they grew up. Now their genes are identical, but the way that the, their environment has affected them, um, th that's you know, broadly speaking is within what we'd call epigenetics. That's what I love is I, I think talking to uh, a lot of people who work in genetics is with biology, there is, you know, some big answers, bigger than, you know, physics is still searching for the theory of everything. In some ways, biology has kind of found the theory of everything, but it's turned out to make things much messier as well. So that bit of trying to make the the, the, the clearness of, the, of I, I know in Robert Plowman's uh, book a blueprint, sort of interesting yeah. stuff on that. So um, now we shouldn't leave the guinea pig now. So let's start with that. You the, the, here, yeah. the, the, there's a guinea pig in an insulated metal pot, which is I kind of think how a lot of people imagine scientists spend a lot of their time. <laughs> what is that story? What, yeah. what, what why so, is that important to metabolism? So this is the um, this is the first fundamentally. Uh, sort of insightful study done of metabolism uh, or energetics ever. And it's the Antoine Lavoisier and his buddy Laplace, they get together. And this is in the 1700s. Uh, so we're in the, in the late 1700s here, sort of 1770s. Um, and you've got uh, Lavoisier, who of course is in, in France, as the name suggests. And he is a chemist and a naturalist. You know, it's, it's the early days of modern science when you get you know sort of if you're a scientist you sort of do everything because it, the fields haven't developed enough to be specialized enough. so people are sort of crossing over boundaries that today we wouldn't think you would but he's um interested in uh in in this new thing called oxygen which people have just discovered he's interested in uh, combustion which is what is it exactly that happens when wood burns for example or anything burns um, he's interested then as well in what happens with the food that you eat and how your body uses that food. And, and is it the same as the way that a, that a fire burns? And that's an open question, completely open question in the 1700s. In fact, people are still arguing about whether this thing called oxygen is real. And if you really do need it for a fire, which of course now we know is, is completely true, but still, you know, these are, this is early days. This is a wild, wild west kind of stuff back then. Um, and so he decides, okay, look, I'm going to try to demonstrate that when your body burns energy, that it really is the same thing fundamentally as a fire burning, that th those combustions are the same kind of event chemically. And uh, so, you know, by that point, it was pretty well understood that if you measure how much heat is given off by a fire uh, and how much carbon dioxide is produced, you can kind of work out the chemistry of exactly what's happened to that wood when, when it burned. And so he goes, okay, well, we got to get some, we have to have a, a living organism's, organism's metabolism, um, you know, confined well enough that we can measure all the inputs and outputs. And so he takes, he and Laplace take a guinea pig and they put it in like a, like a, like a Dutch oven kind of uh, metal pot. So it's a small metal pot inside a big metal pot. Uh, there's a, a, a lid that closes tightly enough that you know, they can kind of get it insulated and sealed off. And in the space between the two pots, they've packed it with snow, right? They had to do this in the winter because there were no refrigerators, of course, to do it in the summer. So they had to do this in the winter. They pack the middle of the snow and then they measure very carefully how much water drips out the bottom. They have a little spout and they measure how much water drips out so they can measure exactly how much snow is melted, how much ice is melted. And at the same time, they're measuring how much carbon dioxide comes out the top, right? 
And and there you go. They, they, they demonstrate with, I think, maybe the original guinea pig. I don't know if this is the first guinea pig ever used in science, right? But they demonstrate that sure as hell, if you burn calories in your body, it's the same as burning wood in a fireplace. And that is, right? That's the light bulb going off. Uh, and Antoine Lavoisier says uh, something like, you know, respiration is combustion. Oh my God. Like this is his eureka moment, right? It doesn't quite get the, you know, it doesn't quite like uh, Hippocrates or Aristotle, whatever, getting in the tub and watching the water go up. It's not quite that good. It's not quite as, you know, but it's almost as good. And it, that is the field of metabolism and nutrition and energetics uh, started. That's it, right? You could, you can pinpoint the moment and it's the moment that that guinea pig gets dropped in a pot. That's fantastic. And that is, and then can you take us through over then the the the, uh, uh, the 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 last couple of centuries, then how has under before we get to your work and what you've sure, discussed, sure. The, the 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 changes in terms of understanding metabolism, and I presume also sometimes the curves which have gone in the wrong direction and the misunderstandings. Sure. Uh, well, so for a long time, um, it took basically the in, the whole of the 1800s to sort out that if you feed an animal a certain amount of food that the that that food either stays behind as new tissue or gets burned off and you can actually measure the carbon dioxide that gets burned off or you can measure the urea the nitrogen in the urine of the animal for example and so just just the basic accounting of calories in and calories out right All, the entirety of the 1800s is spent just sorting that out because it's so hard to do it you got to imagine most of this work is being done with technology that's that's less sophisticated than what you've got in your kitchen, right? And, but they're able to figure all this out. It takes a while. Um, and then you get to where people can measure metabolisms pretty well. They figure out how to put people in kind of an enclosed space or, or a dog or a sheep or whatever they want to study, get it in an enclosed chamber uh, and be able to measure the air that comes out and the air that, the air that comes in and air goes out to, to actually measure calories burned per hour and now at the beginning of the 1900s, you have the field of sort of comparative metabolism. What do you think, you know, people answering questions like, how does body size affect how many calories you burn every day? How do different species burn calories differently every day? Um, and there's two neat kind of wrong turns that go with that, that, that occur there. One is this idea that, um, that we're basically just little stoves and the amount of heat that we generate um, is uh, just a proportion of our, of our surface area. Right. Um, and so for a while, that seems like it must be true. And it turns out it's not. It's actually more complicated that um, that it's small animals burn fewer calories per day than big animals. Mice burn fewer calories every day than elephants, but it's not proportional one to one. So a small animal. So per pound of flesh, a small animal burns a lot more energy than a big animal. And that weird kind of proportionality, that kind of weird economics of scale is called Kleiber's law. And we still really don't understand why it's true. Um, the surface law, surface area law would kind of get you there sort of. And that's why people thought that was it for a while. Turns out the math doesn't quite fit. So we're still in search of exactly why it is. And that, that um, and I can tell you that the formula is, you know, calories per day is proportional to your body mass to the 0.75 power and if that sounds weird and hard to place into any part of normal life you know daily experience yes that's right nobody no, nobody knows why the heck you know why, why is it that it's 0.75 and so that's Kleiber's law that took the early 1900s to figure out people also thought around the same time the other wrong turn was that um, however fast you burned your calories that's how fast you died so if small animals burn their calories faster like we just talked about maybe that explains why they die so fast Right, because a small animal has a shorter lifespan than a big animal. That's that's true. We people have recognized that for a long time, and it turns out that's not quite as simple as that either. Um, you know, birds, for example, if you have if anybody has a pet bird at home, you know that a, a gray parrot might live into its 60s, even though it's relatively small. Whereas your your pet dog, which is a lot bigger, would be lucky to make it into its teens. And so, um, so that's another the other wrong turn. There's some kind of connection between lifespan and, and metabolism but it's more complicated than some, some simple one-to-one. -one. Oh, um, yeah. Great. No, sorry. Keep going. Yeah. I'd, well, I'd, I'd, just, you know, what's cool is that you know, we kind of were in that Kleiber's law world, measuring people and, and animals that we could put in a chamber uh, for the, for all of the 1900s. And then it isn't until, you know, 
basically the Thatcher era in the 1980s that we figure out how to measure energy expenditures in the, in the free living you know, world, daily life using these isotope tracking techniques. And that has been just a complete uh, you know, sea change in the way that we can ask questions and measure expenditures and see what the body's doing. Um, you know, Cause of course, real life doesn't happen in a laboratory. So uh, you know, if we wanna measure energy expenditures in daily life, we need this new isotope tracking techniques. And that's, that's kind of the kind of the era that we're living in now is, uh, is this isotope tracking, it's called doubly labeled water, uh, this era of energetics. And in fact, can you explain a little bit then? So, so how, how does that work, the isotope tracking? Yeah, so all water is hydrogen and oxygen, right? H2O. Um, and if, uh, if you drink some, some isotopically tagged hydrogen, so instead of hydrogen, it's deuterium, um, it won't hurt you, it's not radioactive. Uh, but we can we can watch we can kind of use that isotope as a tracer you drink that hydrogen great your levels would go up so if you take a urine sample after you drink the hydrogen your levels go up and then over time as you flush that water out that isotopically tagged water out we'd see those levels in your body go down 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 and the rate at which they go down tells us how much water you're using every day how much water is getting replenished every day okay now here's the cool thing you do the same at the same time you do this with an oxygen isotope as well so the water that you drink isn't just tagged hydrogen, it's tagged hydrogen and tagged oxygen. The oxygen will, get, will, will give us that water signal, same as your hydrogen does, so it'll flush out with the water that you lose. But the, the oxygen is also lost in the CO2 that you breathe out, carbon dioxide, right? So every about half of every oxygen in the CO2s that you breathe out is ripped out of your body water. And so when we dose your body water with this isotopically tagged water, um, we actually can get a measurement of how much carbon dioxide you're producing because we compare the rate of oxygen loss to the rate of hydrogen loss. They're different and they're different because of how much CO2 you're producing. So we get a perfect measure of how much CO2 you're producing and that's how many calories you're burning because that's how, that's how metabolism works. You make CO2 as you burn calories. I, do you know what you explaining that it does it reminds me why it happens every day but why i love science is sometimes it's subatomic particles going around enormous tunnels at speeds near that of light sometimes it's urine and breathing and isotopes and i just <laughs> think the ingenuity is just so so let's get on to when did you start to be drawn towards metabolism as that particular area of research what what, what was the, the the point where you knew there was yeah. something to find out here so i've always enjoyed you know ever since my mind got completely wrecked thinking about evolution. Um, I think I've always been interested in, in energetics since then because energetics, you know, the, the energy in energy out of an organism, that's where the rubber hits the road in evolutionary terms, right? For, from an evolutionary point, point of view, life is just a game of turning energy into offspring. That's it, that's the game. You do that well, you, you pass on your genes. You don't do it well, you don't. And so, um, you know, in my graduate work, I was putting like, you know, guinea fowl and, people and dogs and uh, other animals and a menagerie of animals on treadmills to figure out the energy expenditure of walking and running. Um, and so I was always interested in that. And then at the end of my graduate work, my first job as a professor, I, I wanted to try to understand whole energy budgets. Where do all the calories go in, you know, for a person or for a chimpanzee or for a gorilla, or how does that work? How does the, how does the body take an energy and decide how to spend it what are the energy budgets of these organisms? And we didn't have that data for humans in a hunting and gathering context. Why is that important? Humans are a hunting and gathering species, right? We've been hunting and gathering for two and a half million years. And so that is an ecologically relevant context for humans. Um, we also didn't understand anything about total energy expenditures in the other apes. And so that hadn't been collected. And so I you know, was looking around in sort of 2008, 2009 and going, this is, you know, terra incognita. This is the best thing you can ask for as a scientist is a totally blank slate with an interesting question. And so we just, we, we dived right into it and have been measuring uh, total energy expenditures with this isotope tracking method ever since in hunter gatherers, farmers, horticulturalists, um, and in, in other primates as well, gorillas and chimps and orangutans and bonobos, everything we can get our hands on. Basically, I'm a, I'm a doubly labeled water um, evangelist or 
I, I don't know. I, let's go with evangelist. If you make it an that. evangelist, it might have then some kind of transubstantiation thrown into it, which is really going to, you know, muddy the waters if we. That's do, right. Do, yes, uh, that's right. This is but, the this is the blood of Lavoisier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>